But we're going to see if we can't wring some hope out of it. The opening lines are really powerful. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can there be very many more poignant phrases than that? These are the words of a person who's in very deep despair. Why are you so far from helping me, he cries out to God. I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Well, some of us, maybe all of us on some level, are familiar with this kind of despair. There are a whole lot of things in our life that just seem really unfair. Things that are so awful that they make us question, can God even be present in the midst of this? But it's interesting, isn't it, that the psalmist doesn't stay just there. The psalmist seems to kind of ping pong back and forth from despair to hope and back to despair again, sometimes praising God and reminding himself that God has done all of these good things. He looks back on the history of his ancestors and remembers that God delivered the ancestors from slavery in Egypt, that God didn't let the people be put to shame. Well, some of us have been there too, where we kind of ping pong back and forth. I've shared with you before, my dad died when I was 12. And when that happened and people said, this is God's plan, I was so angry. I was so angry. I thought, if this is God's plan, I want no part of these plans. And I'm not even sure that there is a God, because if there is a God, maybe this shouldn't have happened. Where was this God when I needed God? So we, we know that kind of despair, despair, but there was a time, too, where I realized, even though I felt like my prayers had been unheard, unanswered, unworthy maybe, useless in some level, I could never entirely let go of my need to talk to God. And I found it puzzling that, you know, I don't believe this being exists, or if he does exist, I don't like this God, because bad things happen, and God doesn't seem to care. But somehow, over and over and over, I would find myself wanting to come back to talk to God. I couldn't let that go in my life. And it was only when I read about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying that God would take this cup from him, that God would not let this crucifixion that was coming happen, that I realized even Jesus prayed for things he might not get. He told God what he wanted. And he said, yet not my will, but thine be done. I might not get this, and I know it, and I turn it over to you. Eventually, I started praying again, too. I realized if Jesus could pray and not know for sure that he would get everything he wanted, I could, too. That's faith, in a way, isn't it? When we offer up to God what's on our hearts and our minds, knowing that we may not get it all the way we wanted, but knowing that God is there for us, come what may. Well, the psalmist apparently doesn't feel worthy, really, of this kind of deliverance from God. He says, I'm a worm. I'm not human, scorned by others, despised by the people. It's shocking almost, isn't it, how low and how devastated this person feels. But you know, a lot of us have been there too, I think. There are a lot of people walking around that have a deep-rooted sense that somehow they are not worthy. Somehow they do not count. Somehow they don't matter to God. But we are all a part of God's creation. And as we remind ourselves in the mix, our children and youth program, you are all a child of God. And I will treat you that way. Well, many of us recognize this first verse from this psalm because we hear it another time in the year. We remember these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. 
which brings up some interesting questions. Jesus would have known this psalm. It's a, it's a part of the worship in the Hebrew temple, so he would have been well aware of it, even though it was written a long time before he lived. We could take this at face value, that he chose at this moment of great pain and fear, no doubt, to say, why have you forsaken me? Pain has a way of doing that, of making us so focused on the pain that we can't focus on what's around us that's good, what's around us that's nurturing us, what's around us that's trying to help. We can only focus on the pain. Well, Jesus was in a human body, so it's entirely fair to think that he felt that type of focus on his pain. And you know, there's even a little bit of comfort, I think, in this thought. It invites us, in the midst of our pain, to question God. Because in a sense, that's what Jesus was doing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Could be translated, where the heck are you in the midst of my pain? Don't you care? Don't you notice? Why are you not helping me? Sometimes when people have had a terrible thing happen to them, they're really reluctant to say, I'm angry at God. But this invites us, this gives us permission to ask God questions. Where are you in my pain? When we hear of two more senseless shootings this week, when there is a dire medical diagnosis that gets made, when we're afraid for ourselves or our loved ones, when there's a tragic accident that makes no sense and takes a life far too soon, don't we all want to cry out, God, where are you? Where were you when this was going on? So it invites us in that sense. If Jesus could ask the question, so can we. But there are elements of this psalm that also make you wonder if Jesus wasn't pointing to the psalm. Remember, the people gathered around him would have known this psalm where. Well, you wonder if he wasn't pointing to it for another reason. Because it goes on, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. They say, commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue this one in whom he delights. Imagine Jesus hanging from the cross with crowds of people looking on. The book of Matthew says those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Others mocked him and said, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel, he says. Let him come down from the cross now, and then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. You hear it? There are some real similar words here. So again, our psalmist flips back to words of assurance, reassurance, really. The afflicted one says, yet it was you, God, who took me from my womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you, I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. And then comes this really plaintive plea. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. He goes on to describe terrible pain. He talks about how dehydrated he is, that his tongue is sticking to his mouth. And we are reminded in the Gospel of John, again at the crucifixion, we hear Jesus crying out from the cross, I thirst. This is a dehydrating experience. Curiously, our lectionary reading ends here with this, this terrible devastation that is going on to the person who wrote this psalm. But we're not going to stop here because there are some fascinating things in the rest of the psalm, including eventually some words of hope. And I bet you're glad to hear that because right now it's sounding hopeless. But first we hear some more pain. The suffering one says, they stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing, they cast lots. That's in the psalm. 
All four Gospels record this happening at Jesus' crucifixion. And the Gospel of John goes so far as to say this was to fulfill what the Scripture said in this psalm that we read today. John clearly sees the psalm as a prophecy about Jesus, who was years and years and years away from being born. But right here, our psalm and our gospel talk about some very similar things. Well then, back to the psalm. The afflicted one prays for God to act quickly to save him, and he promises to tell everyone about God's greatness. You know, in some ways, I can't help but think that that's a bit of bargaining. And, and don't we all do that? The stages of grief that have uh, been talked about for years now, one of them is bargaining, that when something terrible is happening, we want to bargain with God. If, if I praise you, if I <laughs> say good things about you, if only you will see me through this problem, I promise I will, and you can fill in the blanks there. But then the author goes on to describe how awesome life is going to be when this connection with God is remade. The poor, he says, shall eat and be satisfied, and all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and the families of all the nations shall worship him. Posterity will serve him, future generations will be told about the Lord, and proclaim his deliverance to people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. And here we are saying that he has done it. We worship a Lord, a resurrected Lord, a Lord who says there is always hope, even in the most dire circumstances. So what are we to make of this sense of being abandoned by God when we are in the midst of pain? How does this message really help us with our pain and fear when we're suffering? Well, part of my training as both a counselor and a pastor has been in how to approach people who are in a great deal of pain, people who are suffering. And those of you who have taken the training in Caring Connections know this too. The idea is that sometimes less is more. As much as we wish we had words that we could offer to someone that would take away their pain, frequently the best thing we can do is to sit with them in it. We don't have to have magic words. We don't, so that's a good thing. What we need to do is sit with that person and side with that person and help that person shoulder that pain, even if it means taking on some of that pain and grief ourselves. And in a sense, that's a way to look at what it is that Jesus was doing. As God in human form, he felt the same kind of pain we do. He participated in the worst kind of pain that we can have, even to the extent that he felt like he had been abandoned by God. He let us know that he understood it, and then he transformed it. Our story doesn't end with the pain on the cross. Our story continues with a resurrected Lord. Last week, Jeremy talked in his sermon about the church being the body of Christ. And Augustine of Hippo took that metaphor and he applied it to this very passage. Jason Biasi summarizes what Augustine said like this. His mouth, Jesus' mouth, cries out in pain for the sake of all of our suffering. As when our foot is injured, our mouth shouts. Christ does not merely name or experience our pain. He takes it upon himself and he transforms it. The psalmist is not one who has felt distant from God in the past. He's not praying to any God. He prays to a God with whom he has an intimate relationship. My God, he says, my God. And that urge to pray just won't go away. Even in the midst of this agonizing pain, whatever it is this psalmist is suffering, back and forth he goes. I trust you. I know you're here. I hurt. Where are you? But that urge to pray doesn't go away. He questions God, yes, 
But in the very act of questioning God, of shouting at God, of, of saying, where the heck are you, God? He's also declaring, there is still a God with whom I am in communication. You know, that's one reason why reading the Bible helps us. Because I think there's sort of a myth out there for some people that a good Christian means you'll have this charmed life and everything will always be wonderful. But if you read the Bible, the very people that God was blessing all the time were also encountering all kinds of problems. But God was there in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the problems. So it's important for us to remember when we are suffering that we have also seen moments when God was in action. And I want us to take a moment now to close this sermon to think about a time, maybe when you weren't suffering, or maybe you were, but a time when you felt God's presence the most clearly in your life. I want to take a moment to let you sit in silence and bring that to mind, make it alive again in your memory, so the next time you are suffering, you can pull that out and remember the great love and the great compassion of God for you. Take a moment to reflect. Amen. Will the ushers please?